begin here in a moment. Man, I am excited about what God is doing. This week, we start our summer series on Wednesday nights in the book of Galatians. We're going to walk, spend six weeks walking through the book of Galatians, and I promise you, it'll be beneficial to you if you show up. It's going to be been a great time, and I'm, I'm looking forward to your summer being your best summer ever. I'm looking forward to you not fading away, withering away, but you're going to get stronger in the summer. The, the summer heat isn't going to scorch your faith, but you're going to get stronger and better because you're going to drink up this summer. Amen. You're going to drink up. You're going to drink from God's word. You're going you're gonna to be here. So Wednesday nights, I encourage you to be here, and we are uh, getting ready here in just a couple weeks, a few weeks away here from our fireworks stand that uh, helps uh, fund youth ministry, uh, SICON, and other ministries. We're able to fund some missions that we support, and we're able to put the money to good use. And I promise you, you will enjoy being a part of the fireworks stand. We have a great time just blowing things up, having a fun time. You know, it's a good time. So sign up in the lobby. and. I will say for uh, Central Youth Conference, anybody that's seventh grade and up, uh, we are now registering to go. It would be beneficial for your young people to go to this conference. It's one of the top youth conferences in the country that we are a part of. So check all that out. You can find details online as well. Let's go to this word today. I'm, I'm stirred to preach. Enough with announcements. Let's go to this word. We're going to be in the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on one verse media team. I gave you a lot more verses, but just go to the 17th verses where I want to focus on and I'll go back and we'll talk about the rest. But one of the most peculiar scriptures in the text is what we find right here in the 17th verse. It says, as they were building the wall, the workers, the workers were instructed as they built the wall. Nehemiah instructed them in their work that they would carry their materials in one hand. And it says, in the other hand, they had a weapon. In one hand, they carried materials and they did their work. Come on, somebody say work. work. Look at your husband and say work. work. You're like, ah, oh, it should never came to church on Father's Day. Right. They did their work. They carried the materials with one hand and did their work. And with the other hand, they held a weapon. They held a weapon. They did their work with one hand, and they held a weapon in the other. They say that almost 90% of the world is right-handed. Even if I was to ask this morning how many people are right-handed, the majority of the room, that would be your dominant hand. That would be the hand that you dominate, you, you write with, and you, you, you know, text with, or whatever you do with. It's your right hand. It's your dominant hand. They say that 10% of the world is lefties. So, it's, man, there's not very many lefties. But there's a 1%. And so if people ask you, are you left-handed or are you right-handed? The title of my message is, I can use both. Amen. I can use both. I can use both. Let me pray for you one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray right now, help me to speak. Lord, with boldness and accuracy, exactly what you want me to say. In your mighty name, I pray it, Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. I can use both. Yes. The story of Nehemiah is, is a radical story. It's an amazing story. And we don't have time to cover the whole, the whole account in the scriptures. But what we are going to look at today is beneficial for us because... Maybe in front of you seems like there's impossibilities. Maybe in front of you there seems like there's obstacles that are too big. And the book of Nehemiah lets us know that maybe on our own we can't do it, but with God we can. Yes. Nehemiah was, was commissioned by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to restore them to their state and to the dignity of, of the state. And what should have took years to do, and really was a foolish thing in many people's eyes to even try to do, but should have took a long time to accomplish. End up only taking 52 days to accomplish, 52 days to build these walls, which seemed by many impossible to say the least, and should have took many more years. I think this story is riddled with 
the, the, the fact that God's hand was on them is the reason why they were able to accomplish this great feat. Whenever you see things like this, you chalk it up to, man, it was God in this situation. Whenever you see things like this happen, you have to just look at it and say, man, I don't understand it. I'm confused by it. But God was in the middle of it and God's hand was on it and caused it to come to pass. The scripture we read, I think, signifies and really shows us that, that God was working in the midst of these people because what seemed to be counterproductive, what seemed to be um, opposite of what they wanted, they were commissioned to build the walls. They were commissioned to do the work. But instead of putting all their energy into building the wall, he said, you're going to hold a weapon in one hand. You're not just going to work. You're not just going to work, but you're also going to have a weapon. You're not only going to have a trial in one hand and, and do brick and mortar and masonry. He said, that's not the only thing you're going to do. You're going to have a weapon. What seems so backwards, what seems so cumbersome, what seems like, man, I could get a lot more done if you just let me lay this weapon down and go to work. He said, no, that's not the way I want you to do it. I want you to have one hand at work and the other hand with a weapon. With one hand, they worked. And with the other hand, they had a weapon. Don't mess with me this morning. I am armed and dangerous. With one hand, they worked. With the other hand, they held a weapon. They were able to accomplish something that seemed impossible by doing it this way. It seems backwards. I know your way seems better, but God's ways are better than your ways. God's ways seem foolish to the world. It seems like this isn't the way you should do it. It seems like, man, you, it's going to end in destruction for you. It seems like you keep talking all that faith and all of that. You keep on trusting God all you want. But see, you never understand the power of God until you release power. I, I, I think I have enough power to do this on my own until I realize, no, I need all of the help I can get from God. They held in one hand their work materials. In the other hand, they held a weapon. Nehemiah knew that if we're going to meet all this opposition that we're facing, we're going to have to do it. I'm going to have to do it a different way. I'm going to have to do it a strange way. I'm going to have to do it in a peculiar way. It's not going to be a normal way. Come on, I'm abnormal. I'm not normal. God has not called me to normal. He's called me out of darkness into his glorious light. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it different. See, Nehemiah, he could do both. He could do both. He could pray, but he had action. Some people, and I, love, I think prayer, prayer works. It pr changes things. But prayer needs to be accompanied with action. So he said, I can pray, but I also have action. Come on. He said, I got courage, but I also got compassion. I have both. I can do both. With one hand, they were a worker. With the other hand, they were a warrior. Come on. In one hand, they were a worker, but the other hand, they were a worshiper. Come on, we don't, normally we get it the other way, right? Normally we're a warrior and a, or a warrior and a worker, right? We're trying to work, but we're worrying the whole time. Oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? And, I, you're, and you're talking yourself out of it. You're talking yourself out because you're so worried and overwhelmed. And so you're trying to work at this thing. You're trying to work at, at your life. You're trying to work at this thing. But you're trying to do it while you're worrying. He says, nah, -uh. put down the worry and become a warrior. So as you work, you know I'm called to do something great. I'm called. Come on, I'm set apart. God's hand is upon me. Come on, there's, I, I'm going to do, I can use both. I can use both. What do you do when the weapon is in the non-dominant hand? Because at some point between the work, maybe sometime you're strong and I'm feeling good, but I'm weak over here. But what about when the weakness switches and you end up finding yourself at a place where maybe you're strong on this side, your dominant side, but you're, you're weak on this side. What do you do? See, the problem with most people is they take their weakness 
as, as a thing they try to run from and they try to hide from. But you know, your weakness in God can become a strength. Come on, he says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the people that, oh, he says, come on, my strength is made perfect, he says, in your weakness. What do you do when your non-dominant hand is the hand now that you're trying to work with, or you're trying to be a warrior with, and you feel insignificant, you feel unable, you feel inadequate, you feel overwhelmed. Have you ever been there before a church? Come on, you feel outmatched. What do you do in these moments? Can I just tell you something? Don't abandon God in your weakness. Come on, don't abandon God. Don't try to, don't try to get caught up in doing it on your own. Don't try to make it happen on your own. Don't abandon God. God in your weakness. The Bible says that he gives, he gives power to the weak. Isaiah 40, 29. He gives power to the weak. And those who have no might, he increases their strength. Why would you abandon God in your moment of weakness? Why would you allow the voices and the chatter and the naysayers? Don't abandon God in your moment of weakness, see, because real strength, man, is actually found in the Lord. Real strength. Real strength. Real strength is found in the Lord. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'm going to talk about this just for a moment, this, this right hand. The righteous right hand of God. See, in the Old Testament in Leviticus, when the priest would use the anointing oil, they would hold the oil in their left hand, it says in Leviticus. They would hold the oil in their left hand and they would dip their fingers in it with their right hand. Leviticus 14, 16. And they would, they would hold the anointing in the left hand. I want you to catch this. The anointing is in the left hand. Let me just say like this. The anointing is in the weak hand. See, where you want the anointing, you got to realize it's in the weak place. It's in the place. You might not be strong here. You might not. This might be a place you feel outmatched, but the anointing is actually in the, in the non-dominant hand. The anointing is in the place. See, you thought you have to be, you got to be strong to be anointed. He says, no, the weaker you get, the stronger you become. The more you realize, I ain't nothing without God. I'm weak without God. I'm lost without God. I'm, I'm weak. He says, that's where the anointing is found. That's where he says that the, the priest, it would be in their left hand. It would be in their left hand. I could use both. I could use both. See, when I, when I get under the anointing, you get under the anointing, you now, you become different. You become the Benjamites in the Old Testament, the tribe of Benjamin. They were known, there were warriors within that tribe that they called them left-handed, but you got you to gotta study this. They were left-handed, but actually they were, they were what was called uh, ambidextrous. You know what that means where you could use both hands? That they could use both hands. And when the power of God would come upon them in Judges, it says that among them there were some soldiers in Judges 20 that, that there was a select troop that when the power of God was on them, they were left-handed, and they could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. That's some precision. As a, like, you could, like, some of y'all ain't got much. You're with me. I'm like, hit me if you can. If you could get one, get it. But it says that they had such precision, they had such precision and accuracy with their left hand. They're non-dominant hands. See, they say they were left-handed. They were ambidextrous. That means, because really, it's, it's silly when you think of even left-handed, right-handed. Basically, they just say, for people that are ambidextrous, they have two right hands. They're at the place where, now, my left hand, which should be weak, is not weak anymore. Because the enemy thinks you're weak there. Oh, they're weak. They got their, they're using their left hand. But he didn't realize there's a power that comes upon you. I'm so strong when I could use both. 
I can I can use both. I can I can use I will I will take a devil out. Right handed, left handed. I'm coming. I can use both. This scripture we read is amazing in Isaiah that he will uphold us with his righteous right hand. The Bible tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. We know that, right? He's at the right hand of God the Father. And we are seated. We are next to, we are next to Jesus. Is that correct? We're next to Jesus. He's seated at the right hand. Come here, Tevin. It's so good to see you this morning. Can I, can I use you for a minute with them cool J's? Can I get them J's from you? Come on, come up here. No, I'm just kidding. Come on, come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. He's ready. If Jesus is at the right hand, I'm going to act like Jesus for a moment. I'm not Jesus. I promise you. But I'm going to say I'm Jesus for the sake of the illustration. If he's seated at the right hand and you're next to Jesus, what hand are you holding of Jesus's? Come here. What hand, are you, what hand are you using to hold his hand? You're using your left hand, your non-dominant hand. See, some of you, you want to get some work done. You want to, you want to, man, you want to serve God. You want to be bold for Jesus. See, you need to know which hand you need to have hold of Jesus. See, your left hand, your non-dominant hand, your weak hand. You need to keep your weakness attached to Jesus at all times. Come on. Don't let your weakness get out on its own trying to do it on. Get your weakness connected to him. He says, I'm holding you with my righteous right hand. His right hand is is holding your left hand your left hand your hell your hell see the enemy what he wants you to do is he wants you to let go he wants you to let go go try to work on your own go try to make it happen on your own go try to succeed on your own be success driven be be you know about what you want to be about don't trust God don't pray don't seek God marry who you want to marry you're young live with some of you out here you young bucks in the room you're like just live how you want to live you'll figure it out when you get older nah -uh. life will come at you so fast come on your world can change in a moment like that and what you have to realize you got to stay connected he says I want to hold you with my righteous right hand but it's connected to the area you're weak your non-dominant hand thank you so much Kevin he says I'm holding you I'm holding you I'm holding you up. I could use both. See, this sword wasn't for their victory. It was a reminder who's fighting. I'm going to show you here in a moment who, who is fighting for you. Who is fighting for you? See, when you, are, when you use both, you become armed and dangerous, y'all. I'm equipped to handle business. I'm equipped to make changes. I'm equipped to do what God's called me to do. What are you armed against? Why do you need to be armed and dangerous? This is the reason why. Because you become armed against discouragement. You become armed against discouragement. See, as they were working, discouragement tried to set in. As they were working, there became those who came against them in such a way that they would speak things to try to discourage them. Have you ever had anybody try to discourage you from doing something? They try to ask, why are you dreaming like that? Why are you believing like that? You a nobody. You from Topeka. You, you're nobody. You ain't ever, you're never going to get into college. You're never going to do this. You're never going to, oh, you ain't never going to get promoted. You're always going to make minimum wage. You're always going to be here. But when you use both, you become armed against discouragement. See, as they were building the wall, there became discouraging voices. And this is how you know you're in God's will because discouraging voices will begin to come around and try to talk you out of your destiny. And there was a, there was a couple fellas that made themselves known to the people. Sam Ballot and Tobiah. They, boy, they, they like to run their mouth. They like to talk trash. Sam Ballot, which really, I mean, his name is, should have got him the one being clowned, but, I mean, we'll just leave it. Like, his name is terrible. Like, you want to talk trash, but your name is Sam Ballot. Come on, dude. And so, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, when they would, they would talk trash, but look what they would say in the, in the, the first through the third verse. They would, they would say things like, man, look at these poor, feeble Jews. What do you think you're doing? What do you think? You think you can build a wall? in a single day you think you can you think you can do this you really think you think you could take something from this rubbish heap some of you are like that's what's been talked over you your life is a mess you you know what you've done you know how you used to live you used to be on drugs you used, you used to act this way you used to act and what people try to do is they try to discourage you and they would mock they would mock them the third verse Tobiah jumps in 
dumb and dumber right here. <laughs> he was standing beside him and he remarked that stone wall would collapse even if a fox walked along top of it. They were trying to discourage the people of God. The enemy uses a weapon of discouragement and a lot of times it's effective on God's people. They become discouraged. They listen to the voices. They listen to the chatter. They listen to the hate. And if you surrender to discouragement, what you're doing is you're robbing yourself of the hope and the joy that you have in Jesus. I mean, it's hard to keep your spirits up when people are trying to beat you down. That's why it's so vital to have be working with one hand and a weapon in the other. That you stay focused. I know what I'm about. I'm about my master's business. I'm about what he's called me to do. And I'm staying encouraged because I have the sword of the spirit in my hand. I got the word of God available to me to keep me encouraged. Nobody else wants to encourage me. David said, I'll encourage myself in the Lord. All, everybody around me isn't for me. It's all good. People at my job is against me. My family ain't for me. Get serving the Lord. I'll encourage myself in the Lord. I will encourage myself. I got to show you this. I got to show you this. Nehemiah 6.3, I love this. This is the way you deal with haters right here. This is the way you deal with them. Nehemiah, when he knew that these guys, Sanballat and Tobiah, were scheming, he said, I sent a message. And he replied. He said, I replied to them through a message. He said, I just replied and said this. I'm carrying on this great project and cannot come down and stop doing the work that I've been called to do. He said, I'm not coming down off of this wall to you. Some of you let this seem to be, you need to stop trying to defend yourself to everybody. You need to stop coming down to their level. Come on, you need to stop. He says, I'm not coming down off this wall. I'm not getting down to your level. See, that's what happens. You let some foolish folk get around you. You let some people start, and you come down to their level. I'm above that. I'm not even coming down to that. I'm not coming down to your pettiness. I'm not coming down to your drama. I'm not coming down to it any longer. I'm above that. I'm above your dysfunction. I'm above that. I'm not coming down from what God has called me to do to get mixed up in your pettiness. To discourage. He says, he says I'm busy. I'm, I'm, I'm not coming down to deal with you. Some of you need to let the devil know I'm busy. I'm not dealing with you any longer. I'm not. The only thing you're hearing from me is shut up, devil. That's the only thing you're hearing from me, and I'm done. I'm not, I'm not conversating with you. I'm not talking to you because, for one, you're not on my level. You're under my feet, so I'm not talking to you any longer. You're down there, so shut up. I'm up here. I'm continuing to do what God has called me to do. I'm also... I'm also armed now against disbelief because he wants you to, he wants you to lose faith and lose heart in what God's called you to do. And this began to happen among the people in Nehemiah. They begin to get discouraged, but then they also, they begin to wonder, can we, can we do this? The, the doubts begin to set in. Their unbelief begin to set in. And it says in the 10th verse that the people begin to complain. Can I just show you the pattern for disbelief? It begins with complain. Let me help you. Because we live in a complain culture. Everybody got a complaint. Everybody, and we've given everybody a platform to put their complaint out there. Disbelief, it starts with complaining. You start murmuring. You complain. You get negative. I'm complaining. I don't like this. I don't like that. And you start complaining. And, and what happens is that complaining causes you to get tired. It says they complained, but then the workers, they got tired. Now, can I just tell you something? The tiredness was not coming from working for the Lord and with the sword in one hand and the, and the work in the other. No, it was coming from the fatigue, from the complaining, because complaining will wear your spirit out. It's so amazing, people, how when they get negative and they begin to complain, they begin to, they begin to project that it's somebody else's fault. Man, they, oh, I'm getting, they're using me too much at the church, or I'm doing, you know, I'm so wore out because of this, and they want me to do this, and I'm so tired. See, what happened is, is your complaining turned into weariness because even if you get tired but you're you're doing it for God he rejuvenates your spirit yeah maybe my maybe my physical body's work but my spirit is just fine I can keep on going I can keep on going and it says 
that they grumbled and they were tired, but look what happens. And they end up speaking these words. We will never be able to build the wall ourselves. Wow. That's what the enemy wants right there, you to begin to speak. I will never. I will never get free from this addiction. I will never be a good parent. I will never be, you know, more than what I am right now. He wants you to speak that I will never. I will never. But you need to reverse that. When you have the sword in one hand and you're working with the other, what happens is that disbelief, it turns into I believe. Man, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I, I'll quote that over myself every day. I can do all things through Christ, not my own strength, through his strength. He gives me the power. He gives me the strength. The last one is you become armed and dangerous. You get armed against disobedience. This is the reason why obedience is important. Because the Bible tells us obedience is even better than sacrifice. That obedience, you, you singing a little pretty song on a Sunday, that's great. I'm worshiping the Lord. You am here singing loud. But you know what? You actually being obedient to what God has spoken to you is actually better than any song you sing. And when you use both, your right hand, your left hand, what happens is you become armed against disobedience and you now get to a place to where you're not, you're not refusing to go what God's, God's will. You're not refusing to, 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 to try to do it on your own. You're not refusing his plan. You're saying, God, I, I'm doing it your way. God, I'm doing it the way you've called me to do it. See, disobedience and rebellion, it causes the glory in the hand of God to, to depart from your life. Disobedience does. That rebellion, even in scripture, says it's like witchcraft. Yeah. That when you get a rebellious spirit and you turn your ear off and you only want to hear it. That's why sometimes it's hard for preachers because we're like, man, we want to preach what they want to hear. I want amens. I want, good, I want people to be excited about it. I want, and then you say, you know, God said preach something that maybe will offend them. You know, good preaching is supposed to offend your spirit. It's supposed to offend your flesh. I should say, it's supposed to get you like, man, I'm uncomfortable. I know I need, and it shouldn't condemn you. It should convict you. It shouldn't condemn you and make you feel worse about yourself. It should convict you to say, man, I can, I'm better than this. Jesus is calling me to more. I'm not going to stay in my rebellion stuck right here. I'm getting up on my feet and serving God. I'm tired of doing it my own way. God, I'm giving myself over to you. Lord, help me. I mean, I love, I'm human. I love applause and amens. But God, help me. Help me never to preach what people want to hear. But Lord, help me to preach to what they need. What they need, God, what they need. What you need to know is your disobedience is robbing some of you of the hand of God that is on you. Like he's, he's pulling back because you're, you're, you're trying to do it your own way. And he's saying, no, this is the way, this is the way, this way. And you're like... I want to do it my own way. See, when you have, use both, that, that weak part of you, man, it stays so connected to God because you know without him you're going to fall. You know without him, man. It's like, and this is the thing, whenever you get to the point where you're like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm so strong. People scare me when they start talking that way. I'm so strong. I'd never do that. I would never do that. How could they, how could they cheat on that? How could they do that? How could they go back to this? How could they? I would never do that. That's when I got to look and be like, to shake my head because the Bible tells us that pride comes before a fall. You should never say, I would never do. You say, by God's grace, I will never do. With his, with his hand and my hand together, the areas of my life where I'm weak because everybody in this room, don't try to front like you all this and that just because you got your church clothes on this morning. I don't care. Everybody in this room has something you're still weak at. And the only way you could get strong is it with your hand and God's hand. And he says, do that. Being obedient is to keep your hand in my hand. I'll give you the strength you need. Nehemiah 4.14, and I'm closing. Nehemiah 4.14, it says, and they looked over. He says, I looked over things. Nehemiah, he looked over the situation. He looked over the, the thing. He observed the, the, the situation. And he said, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. 
is he's saying, don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of the haters. Don't be afraid of your adversaries. Don't be afraid of them. He says, remember the Lord who is great. You need to be reminded. Somebody needs to be right, reminded this morning. The Lord is great. The Lord is awesome. We attach awesome to a lot of, but to a lot of things. I mean, I think your shoes are pretty awesome, Tevin, but they're nowhere near God. And so we say shoes and clothes and cars and a house and all this. That's, that's awesome. But we do that word no justice because our God is the only one who could carry that name of being awesome. He is great. He is awesome. And when you remember that God is great and awesome and fight for your brothers and your sons come on some of you this morning you need to realize the fight you're in is not just for you but it's for your it's for your sons it's for your daughters it's for your brothers it's for your sisters it's for your homes it's for your neighborhood it's for my city that's why we're here that's why victory city church is in this city we are fighting for this city he says remember this remember this remember this In the 19th verse, he said to the officials, he said, the work is extensive. It's spread out. I know. It's a, it's a major, it's a major work, y'all. It's, it's an impossible thing, he says. So when we're separated, just like this morning, we're in this room and the faith level's high and all that, but I know you're about to walk out of this place and I know you're not always going to have a piano playing and a preacher preaching and a praise team singing. You're not always going to have that. So you got to know what to do when you get in that place. He says, when you get in a place, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what he says is, you need to get to the place. When you hear the trumpet sound, get to the place and watch what happens. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Basically saying, you got to know where to run. You, not, you gotta know where to go. Don't run from God, run to God. Get to God. When attack comes your way, get to God. When attack is, is on the right, you gotta get to God. And he says, when you are under attack, I love this last part. Our God will fight for us. See, you thought the, the weapon so you could win a battle on your nah. He says, the weapon is a reminder God's fighting for me. The weapon is a reminder that God is fighting my battle for me. He says, you have no need to fight in this battle. He says, stand still and say the salvation of the Lord. You could do both. You could be a worker and a warrior. Come on. You could be a worker and a worshiper. Come on, you could do both. You could do both. Stop, stop trying to separate the two. Stop trying to separate what God is. You, if you really want to be at the level what God's called you to, the maximum, you got to be able to do boat heads bowed all over the room I want to pray come on I want to pray and I want to declare this multitasking anointing on your life today oh my goodness they say it's not good to multitask yes it is in the spirit I'm multitasking I'm ambidextrous I could do both I can do both you think I'm at you devil you think you can get me with my right hand you better watch out my left hand is coming for you I'm South Paul I'm coming You could do both. You could do both. You could do both. You're in this room today. And you say, "That's for me. I wanna. I wanna be a person that uses both. That's me." Just lift your hand right where you're at. Come on. Come on. All over this room, hands are lifted. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. I just declare over your people right now an anointing, Lord, that they could use both. Right hand, left hand. They could use both. They will stay at work with their right hand, but Lord, they are gonna keep their left hand. Lord, cleanse to you. Lord, they are called. They have been set apart for you. And Lord, even though the enemy has tried his best to keep them from their destiny, they heard this word this morning. They know now they are armed and they are dangerous. They are ready for battle. They are battle ready. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray, Lord, right now that they will not be discouraged, but they will be encouraged. They will not have disbelief, but they will believe all things are possible through you, Jesus. And they will not be disobedient, but they will be obedient to your voice, to your word. Lord, they'll be obedient to when you speak and you tell them to do it. Lord, they're going to do it. They're going to walk in it. God, that's what you've called them to. I declare it over their life right now. I want you to say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm armed and I'm ready because you've made me equipped. I can use both. I can use both. 
In your name, Jesus, I pray it. Amen. Amen. You better give him the best praise. Come on this morning. 